Hi there, welcome to Walnut Hill Online. My name is Crystal and I'm the online director. Whether you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or through the Walnut Hill Online website, our heart is that you would engage with the Lord and connect in meaningful community online. To connect today, engage with the hosts and other attenders in the chat area by asking questions, sharing how you're doing church where you are, and talking about what is on your heart as the Lord speaks to you during our worship service. For one-on-one -on -one private prayer, click Live Prayer at Walnut Hills Church Online. We consider it a privilege to pray with and for you. So don't hesitate to engage with us in this way. If you have kids from preschool to grade six, there is an opportunity for them to engage with God at their level. On Walnut Hills Church Online, click Kids in the navigation bar at the top of the screen, and you'll be taken to a page where you can download a lesson for today. One more thing, no matter where you are, this is church, and church and worship is for everyone. Take a moment to remove any barriers to your worship so you can hear from the Lord and turn up the volume on your devices. We're gathered together to worship our Lord in song and through generous giving. Today, we are going to hear an important and timely message about Jesus's heart for you. Be sure to engage in worship today through prayer, singing, and even dancing, any way that's authentic to you. Now, let's get into service. God bless you today. Reading. 
at Walnut Hill. My name is Becca Mowry, and I'm our worship director. And this week, I have been reading through the book of Nehemiah, and it is awesome. And I'm in the part of the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. And during this rebuilding, the people are weary. There's so much opposition, and there's so much division. And they're fearful, and they feel exposed, and they feel vulnerable. And it is in this moment that Nehemiah in chapter 4, he stands up and he addresses the people and he says, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along this wall. But whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there and our God will fight for us. Maybe today our worship can be like the sound of that trumpet. You see, the trumpet was the warning sound that they were under attack and the people would gather wherever they heard the sound of the trumpet, they would gather and fight for each other. And today, let that be our worship as we are spread out in our homes and all across this country in this world and maybe even separated in heart. I pray that as we worship, that it would be like the sound of the trumpet that would call God's people together. As we sing out the name of Jesus, let that be today our cry, uniting our hearts and saying, Lord, bring heaven to earth today.
praise your holy name, God. Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. It is written, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Your beauty meant so great a mercy, a dark affair of such boundless grace, that God
praise you this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you so much that we can come and worship you in this way. And Lord, I just, uh, just want to pause and thank you for the ways that you prepared us, uh, even for such a time as this. I just want to pause and I want to point something out to us all this morning. Do you remember that we launched our Ignite Compassion Year in September? We talk about it all the time, you probably remember. But I just can't imagine how, uh, it's amazing to me just how God knew in advance exactly what we would need. I want to just read the prayer that we've been, we've been talking about and praying throughout this entire year. And instead of reading it, I'm actually going to pray it. Will you pray it with me? Lord, thank you for giving this to us months ago, in fact, years ago. Thank you for knowing, Lord Jesus, that we would need to be praying this prayer. So, Lord, transform our hearts, we pray. Lord, give us your eyes, Lord Jesus. Lord, open our ears, and Lord, empower our hands. Lord, as we've been praying this prayer and contemplating what it means in our lives this year, God, I believe you've prepared us to be men and women, boys and girls, who, who have learned and are learning to love as you have loved. I, I, I'm, I picture you, Lord Jesus, in many situations, moved with compassion, a guttural, spirit-filled moment where you were moved with compassion and you reached out and you touched those who were hurting. And Lord, we just pray you'd help us to be those who do that. I think of what you told us in your gospel, John. You said, now I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And Lord, I just believe that you're calling each of us, your disciples, your church, which isn't a building but it is your people, to learn this kind of love, this love that moves in compassion, this love that is stirred up within and changes and transforms a person and a people group and a, and a world if we were to allow you to do that in us. So we pray, God, again, that you will transform our hearts, that you will give us your eyes, that you will open our ears, and you will empower our hands in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been wonderful already just to worship together. I love the words of the songs that were chosen this morning. Uh, they remind us that we are people that need the Lord Jesus. And we are a people that can be so thankful to what God, for what God has done for us. He's done just so many phenomenal things. First and foremost, he's given us grace. He's given us an opportunity to be in relationship with the Father. And one of the ways that we say thank you to our God is to give to his church. And this morning, we're going we're gonna to have our time of tithes and offerings. Some of you have already done this. You've already gone to Realm, which is one of the ways that we, we give. You've gone online. You've done that. I want to pray, that, pray for you that you'll use this moment just to worship and thank our Lord. For, the, for others of you, you may want to text to give this morning, and you'll see how that's done uh, on the screen there for you as, you as you participate in worship. We want to ask you this morning not just to, to give out of obligation, but to give out of the joy of the Lord in your heart and life. That's really where giving becomes worship. So let's now... Just give to the Lord who's given to us so generously. You're going to hear a beautiful song this morning that re reminds us of the love of God and the ways that it, it transforms us. So let's pray, and then we'll continue our worship through giving. Lord Jesus, thank you so much again that you have been the God who yet again has, has provided for us in every way. You have given us uh, the, the foresight to, to, to reach out and be prepared for what you are doing in your world and to, to be those who, who love well to demonstrate love. And Lord, as we give back just a little bit of what you've given to us so generously, we want to be reminded this morning of the God who loves and empowers us to love. So use this moment to remind us of that, to worship you in the ways that we, we give our tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother 
Others have experienced challenge and heartache. Some have worked hard at their day jobs. Others are searching for a job to sustain them. Some have poured into their families. Others dream of having a family. They may not be us or look like us, but their stories are our stories and their lives are our lives. And they remind us that we've all come from different places and situations. But there is one thing that isn't different about us. There's one area of common ground that we can't run away from. All of us, every single person gathered here today is in desperate need of God. Whether we admit it or not, we all need God desperately. In our highs, in our lows, in our confusion and in our clarity in our loneliness and our doubt, in our joys and in our sorrows. We're all in desperate need of God. And that's our common ground. That's our universal need. And that's why church is so beautiful. Because when a gathering of people is found at the intersection of diversity and desperation, well, you never know what God might do. Well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Walnut Hills worship today. So grateful that you're worshiping with us. And we have a special message 
for a, a moment like this. And my name is Brian, and I'm one of the lead pastors here. Again, it's just a privilege to be able to share with you. I'm joined today by two of my good friends. This is Nero Feliciano, uh, who I've known for a long time. You've heard her speak here at Walnut Hill. Uh, she's a psychotherapist, but uh, and a longtime member of Walnut Hill. And then this is Crystal Ellington, and Crystal's been coming to the church for a long time as well. She's actually, you've probably seen her, you probably already saw her, actually, yeah. as the service <laughs> began. She is our online campus director, and, um, and uh, her husband, Christopher, is our production director, too. So pretty much everything you see, uh, Christopher, is, is behind it. So thank you guys for sharing today. We, um, we do believe that God wants to move powerfully today. Uh, he's called his church together. Although we're not in the same room, uh, we are together. The Lord is going to speak to us today. I want you to plan on that. I want you to plan on the Lord coming and moving in each one of our hearts. I want you to plan on the Lord speaking a prophetic word to you. Mm -hmm. I want you to, to plan on God uh, healing. Uh, I want you to plan on God convicting. Uh, I want you to plan on God doing a great work in our lives individually but as a church together. And uh, friends, we've all been so hurt and horrified by the things that have been taking place in our world. And that they've been highlighted in this past month, the syst systemic racism that's happened over hundreds of years has been highlighted in these past few months. And it's hurt our hearts and there have been a lot of questions. What do we do, where do we go from here? And there are a lot of messages out there, a lot of things that you can hear, and a lot of good things. But Crystal, Nero, and I believe we have a word for this church, for this moment, for us as we move forward. What I believe the Lord wants to do today is ask us to recommit to three truths. You know, we stand on the word of God. We believe in the word of God. It's such a gift to us. It teaches us about who God is and about who we are as his people. And we want to recommit today to three foundational truths. And so we're going to jump in along the way. We're just going to kind of pass the baton back and forth. But the three foundational truths that we want to talk about today is we are image bearers, we are called to love, and we are the body of Christ. And so I'm going to pass it off to Crystal to start us as we talk about how we are image bearers. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Brian, for like really opening up this moment for us, I think as a body, we really need to have this discussion. And so um, it's so important that it's not just us talking. We've heard from a lot of different people and we carry our own stories. And so we're sharing what we believe the Lord has really placed on our heart for this moment. Yes. So that first truth that Brian mentioned, it's we are image bearers. And we see this come up very early in the Bible, in the first book, in the first chapter, for instance. Um, it's from Genesis chapter one, verse 27, and it reads, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So as we think about that, what we're saying is that God created each and every person, whether you're from Connecticut, whether you're from anywhere in the United States, anywhere around the world, you are created in the image of God. Amen. No matter what your differences are, how you appear, how you talk, your language, your thoughts, you are an image bearer of the living God. Amen. And because we are image bearers of the living God, that means that we are, have value and we have worth and we have purpose as defined by him. One of my favorite verses is in Ephesians chapter 2 and it's verse number 10 and it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You're a masterpiece. Not just a piece or a, a little thing. You're a masterpiece made by the master. That means you are a work of art. He took time and thought mm. when he made you. There are things that you have to do that nobody else can do. God is the master artist and creator. He set this world into motion and has each and every one of us has given us a role, a job, a purpose. And you, you as a masterpiece can fulfill that. But the problem is is that we don't see each other that way. What we see is our differences. We see black, we see Sri Lankan, we see white, we see man, woman, we see um, from Africa, from Asia, we see those things and we catalog those things. And in our minds, we, con we subconsciously make them more important than the fact that we are all image bearers, right. that God created each and every one of us. 
And so we see this lack of unity is a result of our idea that unity is equated with sameness. We don't have to be the same to be united. This church is a beautiful body. It's a diverse body. And we can be united with one purpose, to worship the name of the living God, to lift him high, to make him famous, and to make him known in this world. Amen. So the thing is that we have faulty vision. And that vision needs to be healed by the living God, by Jesus. And there's a story in um, Mark chapter 8. It's a really interesting um, example of one of Jesus' miracles where he healed a blind man. He took this man out, into, out, of the, out of the town and out kind of away from every other person. And he touched his eyes. And he said to the guy, hey, can you see? And the man said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. And then Jesus touched his eyes again, and the man could see everything very, very clearly. Our problem is right now, we're like that man. We see people as trees just walking around. We don't see the fullness of who they are. Now, if you're thinking you're seeing everyone for who they are, think about the kind of language you use when you talk about different kinds of people. If you're considering everyone to be an image bearer, someone who Jesus himself formed and made, there is no room for language that does not reflect that we were created by the living God. We cannot be saying those people. We cannot be calling people out of their names or any kind of derogatory comments mm. that could cause people hurt and shame and pain. Yeah. So when we don't recognize people as image bearers of God, we do have that vision of that man who saw people walking around as trees. But we have hope. We have Jesus. And he can touch our eyes and he can make us to see more clearly, more fully. He'll help us to have the hearts for the people around us, the heart that he has for us. And so we have to do one thing that's yield to the Spirit. We have to say, yes. yes, Lord, I want to see people the way you see them. These are your creation. I love them. Lord, help me. Tenderize my heart. Make me able to do these things. Yeah. And God will do it. But you have to allow him. And you will feel conviction. It will be uncomfortable. Mm. And that's okay. We can do hard things, right, church? Yes. So as we allow the spirit of the living God to work inside our hearts and our minds. We can become the fullness of the image bearer God has created us to be. We're supposed to reflect the goodness of God, his love, his truth, his faithfulness, all the things that God is. That's what an image bearer of God is. And so we have to do that. That's the only way that we can show that we are the bearers of God's image. Amen. That might be enough right there. <laughs> My goodness, we are image bearers. Some of you needed to hear that word that you are an image bearer. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen yourself that way. You, you are. I love though, Crystal, she pointed out, she said, you are. Oh. You need to receive that today. Others of you need to hear that other people are image bearers. Now we need to treat everybody uh, knowing, knowing the truth that God created them specifically for a purpose. They are wonderfully made. And so uh, I do pray that prayer that the Lord would touch us again, Amen. that we'd have clearer sight to be able to see people in the way that God sees them. Amen. This leads us to our, our second truth that we want to share and recommit to, and that is that we are called to love. Um, I want to read a passage that was actually read earlier in our service, and that wasn't planned, but I think it was planned by the Lord. Amen. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, this is Jesus speaking. These are red-letter words. It says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And what I find interesting about this is that it says, I give you a new commandment. What do you mean it's a new commandment? No, Scripture tells us all through the Bible to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, to love your neighbor as yourself. It's all through there. What's it mean, a new commandment? Well, I think what Jesus was saying is, hey, listen, disciples. Listen, people who have been following me. You've now experienced and seen what real love is. Amen. You, you, you've experienced the level that I'm calling you to. So now go and live to that level. Amen. Go and live by the power of the Spirit to be love to this world. I want to share uh, something with you. It actually is going to come from a good friend of mine. His name is Tim Reed, and, and many of you know Tim. He's our production coordinator in New Milford. He's been a longtime friend and member of this church, and he has some powerful words he wants to share with us as church, his church family, about what it means to love one another. Hi, thank you, Brian, for inviting me into the conversation. 
Uh, hi, Nero. Hi, Crystal. Thank you so much for uh, being here and, and taking the time in this moment to share uh, your heart and your thoughts. Um, and I, I, I stand with you. Um, I was outraged this week. I was hurt this week. I was frightened this week. I was reminded this week in a great way of things that I'm aware of every day that I wake up. I'm aware that I, that there is a potential that I could be one traffic stop away from uh, being killed or incarcerated, falsely accused of a crime, um, just seen as the wrong person, the wrong shade at the wrong time, um, as are many of my brothers and sisters, we share that same burden every single day. You may not see it, but we carry it. And as I mowed the lawn on this past Sunday, the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, so many people are outraged and rioting in the streets that didn't know George Floyd, but they were outraged at what happened to, uh, to another black man. And the Lord said, you know me, Tim. Where's your outrage for what they did to me? I came into town and they loved me one day. And before the end of the week, they were spitting in my face. They beat me beyond what, a lot, what people even could recognize. They placed a crown of thorns on my head out of spite, just, just to shame at me some more. They brought me into a court where there was no judge, just a bunch of angry people. They ridiculed my family. Anyone that followed me, they chased them into hiding. They even forced my best friend into silence and he denied me. And then they hung me on a cross in front of my mother. Where's your outrage? And I began to weep. And because it's, it's true. And then he showed me how I come into his, his church with apathy. I don't like this song. I don't like the way he wore that shirt. I think it would have been better with a jacket. Imagine being at George Floyd's funeral or memorial service with that kind of apathy in your heart. It just wouldn't happen. No one, no one would think that we would be that way. But look at how we come into the house of God, the house of our Savior who died for us, who bore these, the weight of these things on himself personally. He convicted me. And he said, before you speak, Tim, about love, let me show you. Before you think you're better than anybody, let me show you where you've been wrong. And he revealed it to me in my heart. And it broke me. And it silenced me for days. I couldn't speak on any of the rioting or the or what happened to George Floyd or what what was going on with the police. I, I, I couldn't even get past my own hypocrisy to speak and judge anybody. And then from deep inside came a deep down desire to express love to any person I saw, it didn't matter, white, black, Indian, Asian, uh, doesn't matter. I just wanted to reach out and touch somebody and say, listen, I love you, I know it's not you. And then I was reminded that I can't even touch my, my brother. I have to stay six feet away. We have to raise a banner of love that shames hate to the ground and makes it hide its face 
in the presence of love. We have to raise a banner, a standard of love that's set by the sacrifice of Christ. Raise that banner high. Instead of being the first person to show what you look like out at a protest, show them a standard of love that they can recognize that will shame the hate that we see. Please, find it within yourself. Search deep. If you don't have an example, look to God who'll show you an example. And then let's put this love, standard of love, in high places. I'd love to see us get prayer back in our schools so that there's a standard of love that everyone falls underneath. Let's get a standard of love in our courthouses that it's no longer let, as long as I can manipulate you to believe that this is the truth and that's the truth. No, no. The real truth shall set you free and it will hold up a standard of love for all people to recognize that we can make mistakes, we can be held accountable, and we can be forgiven. And we can move forward to be the people that God has ordained us and called us to be but it starts within yourself. I want to challenge you to look into the mirror today and just say, Lord, where, where, where am I being hypocritical? Would you reveal it to me? Would you reveal to me my apathy? Change my heart. Create in me a clean heart and a new and right spirit so that I can reflect love into my community into uh, the places of power that create our laws so that there's a standard that I personally live by and I personally go by and I personally vote for so that we can actually be the change that we want to see. Thank you guys for your time. God bless you. Well, I want to first just thank and honor Tim for that powerful message. What you don't know is right behind the camera that I'm looking at right now is Tim Reed. And I want to honor you, Tim, for those words. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for challenging us. I think if every person who heard that took it seriously mm. and really moved out and raised a banner of love, our world would be different. Amen. I think you've just given a clarion call to our church to be a loving people. You see, we've heard a lot of messages about love. A lot of messages about love. What I'm talking about and what Tim's talking about is a new revelation of love, mm -hmm. a new standard. Friends, we've talked about how this could be one of the church's finest moments. How is that going to happen? It's gonna happen if we have a new revelation of love, that we'd step into a new standard of loving one another. Thank you, Tim. We wanna share the third truth with you now, and that is that we are the body of Christ. And I've asked Nero to, to share on that, Nero. So we are one body, and if we look at 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how we are one body with many parts, we are interdependent on each other, we are different, but we are all called to function together, to live life beautifully as God intended. Now I'm gonna jump down to verses 25 and 26, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Mm -hmm. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Friends, it's easier to rejoice when people are rejoicing, but right now we're in the midst of many people feeling pain and suffering. So my question to you today is, are you suffering too? Is your heart grieved the way God's heart is grieved? Are we experiencing some of the same pain? Are we feeling that grief? Are we really operating as one body of Christ? And if not, maybe we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be one body? Yeah. I'd like to read you a letter by one of our own 
in the family of Walnut Hill who sent us this letter to give us a snapshot of her life this past week. This is what she writes. I am exhausted. Exhausted from a three-month season of quarantine. As an especially high-risk individual, I have spent every waking moment trying to keep myself and my family safe and healthy. I'm exhausted from being thrown into educator mode, supporting multiple children in distance learning, all at different abilities and levels, all while sharing with them what COVID-19 is all about and why communities of color are seeing COVID-related deaths at a disproportionately high rate. I'm exhausted from managing a work from home atmosphere, more Zoom calls and meetings than I thought possible, and also trying to think through a plan B in the event my husband or I lose our jobs in this uncertain time. And while exhausted by all of this, the events of the past few weeks have replaced exhaustion with righteous indignation, worry, and despair. The narrative which has been the same for the past 400 years racist attacks, murders of black Americans, the aftermath of which has further exposed attitudes of discrimination, implicit bias, and utter silence among some of the same people who pre-COVID-19 sat nearby in a church service praising our Lord, or since COVID-19 have commented publicly and quite often about feelings surrounding the right to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, but in this time now, silence. You see, I can't look away. I can't pray this away. I can't look at the TV with disgust and then go back to life as normal. I'm a lover of Jesus. I'm a lover of all my black and white friends. I do see color. I'm a black American raising black children. This is my reality. I have to look my children in the face Share with them that they were created in the image of God and also impart to them that some people honestly believe that they are less than because of skin pigmentation and culture. I have to teach them that this grieves the heart of God mm. and that as they work out their personal relationship with him, they need to know that God is a God of justice. Yeah. That their lives are no less significant to God, but yes, they are less significant to many others perhaps even others who call themselves Christian. Mm. I have to teach them what it means and how to say it should they be profiled, something we have been teaching them for a few years now. There's a real anxiety in the experience of spending years teaching your children to play nicely and treat people the way you want to be treated, only to know that one day you'll have to follow that message with but as an African American, you won't be afforded that same privilege. You may consistently be treated unfairly or unequally. As I've made my pain and frustration know, I've known, I've been met with more implicit bias, more ignorance, and discriminatory language. Your kids will be fine. They are, they, they are learned and they speak well. Your kids won't be targeted. They're super cute and they act so well behaved. Your kids aren't like those thugs who are setting their own communities on fire. And this, a comment made to one of my children by an educator. Why is this bothering you so much? This doesn't concern, concern you. Mm. Friends, this is not helpful. It is hurtful, oppressive, and it is wrong. Our conversations have been extremely difficult, tearful, prayerful, and open-ended. Their emotions range and include fear and anxiety, hopelessness, and despair. One of our children has even questioned, why is life even worth living if these are the conditions we have to live in and if we have to be scripted with what to say if we're being profiled? Mm -hmm. This is despair. This is hopelessness. This is our reality. We are exhausted. Mm -hmm. So I ask you that question again. Are you suffering too? Mm -hmm. If you're not, I will say this. We don't always have to feel suffering to know that we need to do something about it. I liken this to a diagnosis, say cholesterol, or even worse, cancer, that comes out of the blue when we're feeling fine. When we get that news, when we know, even though we don't feel it, we have to do something about it. Because if not, it will destroy our body, 
and the life that we were intended to live in, the way that we were intended to live it. And friends, this is what we're called to now, whether you feel it or not. Mm. We are being called to empathy, mm. which is action, which is, em- I'm sorry, we are called to being empathetic, hearing and listening and understanding, and then we're called to action. And empathy yeah. plus action is compassion. Yeah. Church, this is our such a time as this moment. Yeah. If we who have the power of the Holy Spirit to heal, to learn, to discern, to gain wisdom, to love, if we who have that power can't do it, it is not going to be done Mm. in this world. So may the world know us by our light. May they know us by our healing. May they know us by our love. And may they run to the source of it, which is Jesus. But God is not going to do it for us. Mm. We have to act. Amen. 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 Well, friends, we want to recommit to these truths that we are image bearers, that we are called to love, and we are the body of Christ. You know, as we were thinking about this moment, and as I was praying about it, the Lord just laid these words on my, on my mind, and that they are, these are the words, that this is a kairos moment. Now, the word kairos means time in Greek, but there are two main words in the Greek used for time. The first is chronos, which means chronological. It's just kind of like your watch. It it keeps systematic time, chronos, chronological. But then there's kairos. And kairos means an opportune time for action. Mm. Friends, I want to call Walnut Hill into an opportune time for action. This is an opportune time for us to change the tide, for us to step into a new standard of love. For us to step into the realization and pursue the fact that we are image bearers. To rediscover that we are the body of Christ and act like it. Truly act like it. In a way that the world sees the love of Jesus Christ. And it will take the filling of the Spirit. We want to talk about this Kairos moment. So if we were to go 10 years from now and look back and, and we were able to say, yes, that was a Kairos moment. What would define it? And I want to share just two ways I believe that this is going to be defined. One, through our learning, and two, through our doing. And so we're going to talk about those two things now. Crystal's first going to talk to us a little bit about this Kairos moment and what it means to be learners. It's time for us to learn, but the first thing we have to acknowledge when we are saying it's time to learn is that we don't know everything. And that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable and vulnerable but our vulnerability reveals who we really are. And this is a moment, church, where we have to get to really know one another, right? Mm. And so I had been shocked into silence because I had seen nothing or heard nothing from the people who say that they love me this week. And then the Lord drew me out and pr- pretty much pushed me to talk about how I felt in staff meeting on Monday. And the overwhelming response of love and support surprised me because I hadn't heard anything before, but it was so good to know that when I, when I allowed myself to be vulnerable in that moment, mm. that I received that support. So I think sometimes friends, especially my black friends and people of color, we have to be willing to be a little more vulnerable, and it's hard. It's mm. really hard, but we have to do it. The second way we can learn is by intentionally engaging with folks. So when someone asks you how you're doing, responding with an I'm fine, well, that's not really helpful. But if we're asking the how are you doing, don't wait for the I'm fine and then walk away. Stay and ask, maybe even again, what's it like being you today? Or Mm. how are you really doing? Mm. Because I think that I'm fine or I'm okay, I say that a lot myself, is only like the tip, tip, tip tippy top of the iceberg. There's so much going on underneath. And there's no way that we can learn from one another if we are not being honest with one another. Yes. We can also learn by readings for those of you who like to read, and I love to read, so I have a couple of uh, suggested books for you. We have um, Dream With Me by John Perkins, and he came and visited us. I don't know how many years ago that was, but I remember him being here, and he stirred me up with what he saw growing here, and here we are in this moment. 
Another book we have is White Picket Fences by Amy Julia Becker. Both of these books address the challenges of justice for all people of privilege and race, and they will be something that will help you to open your eyes. So reading, reading, reading is a good thing to do. The last thing I think we can do for learning is listening. And I'm not talking about you're waiting to your turn to talk. You know how sometimes kids, you can tell they're not listening to you, they're waiting to respond? No, <laughs> I'm talking about waiting, listening, and like actively engaging your thoughts and trying to understand what people are saying, understanding where the hurt is, where does it lie? These are the only ways that we can learn. We have to learn from one another, we can learn by reading, and we have to grow together. And that's the only way that this will happen. Yeah. One of my favorite stories, I always say that as a preacher, one of my favorite stories. <laughs> one of my favorite stories is in the book of Acts, chapter 10, and I don't think we understand the dynamics that are happening. Maybe we, we never could, but Peter and Cornelius are both called by God in a vision through dreams. And Peter a Jew, Cornelius a Gentile. Right. Neither shall the two cross. Uh, really, really. You talk about racism, talk about division, big time there. And the Lord calls and sends Peter to Cornelius' home. And I love there, there's this thing you could just read over real fast, but it says, Peter entered the home. Right. Oh, I love that. Friends, I think it's time to enter each other's homes. I'm not just talking physically, but that means Peter experienced who Cornelius was, heard his family talk, ate his food, <laughs> walked with him, right. talked with him, spoke with him, experienced who he was. Uh, right now is a moment for us to enter each other's homes, to really listen and learn about one another. Mm -hmm. But also, um, Nero, this question has been asked so frequently over these last weeks, years, what can we do? Um, if this is truly a Kairos moment, there must be action involved. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? It is a time to do, it's a time for action, but thoughtful, informed, considerate action. Right. And as Tim said, that is birthed out of love, not outrage, not disbelief, not anger. It's not a time for silence, which only adds to the pain and suffering that people of color are experiencing right now, but it's a time to act. So as you asked, what can you do? So I asked God to show me something this week because I wasn't hearing from God as clearly as I do at different points, and it was a hard week. And I also recognize it was a hard week because when we enter into this conversation, we are entering an intense spiritual battle. That's right. We have to recognize who the bigger enemy is here. It's not the person who doesn't think like us or look like us. There's a bigger enemy, and that enemy will take every opportunity he can get to dismember and destroy this body of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as I was praying, God popped a chapter and verse into my head, which he does sometimes. And this time it was from... 1 Kings chapter 4. Now, I, do, I don't know what's in 1 Kings chapter 4. I do not know the Bible like that. But I read it, and at verse 29, it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Friends, this subject is so complex. It is historical. It's psychological. Mm. It's political. Yeah. We need God's wisdom and discernment. Yes for that breath of understanding. So first and foremost, pray for that. Yeah. Also pray because we are all gifted differently and we're mm. called to different roles in this. There are many lanes in this highway that can get us to the same place, but ask God to show you yours. How has he gifted you? How does he want to use you in this? We need that discernment to know how we personally should act. As Crystal said, number two, listen, learn, and read. Those were great resources. If you're not a reader, <laughs> I happen to have a podcast <laughs> called All Things Life with Nero Feliciano. It, you can listen to it anywhere podcasts are and on my website, neurofeliciano.com. I have devoted the last several episodes to teaching, to sharing experiences, and, and the wisdom that God has given me on this in these moments over the last few days and weeks. So check that out. And number three, start with you. Before we want to make any change externally in the world, we have to start internally. As Tim said, we first have to make the changes in ourselves. And, and in terms of family, your family, your kids are looking at you to take the lead. Yeah. They're looking at you as the role models. 
Start with your family and in your own circles. Have the conversations. Have the conversations about differences, both mm. celebrating differences, but also the challenges of differences. Ask yourself the question, are you raising kids that can recognize injustice and inequality and then have the desire and passion to do something about it? Right. Yeah. And that requires teaching and that requires knowledge. Start in your own circles. Make friends who don't look like you, who maybe may not think like you, mm -hmm. who are in the family of God. Invite them over at a safe distance, <laughs> socially <laughs> distancing, as we can do right now. Have conversations with them, break bread with them, get to know them, because we need to build trust, and we need to build trust on both sides of this equation if we're gonna move this forward. Yeah. Get involved in your schools. Make sure they're talking about people of color, mm. the accomplishments of people of color. Yeah. Teach us in your families, read books together, watch movies. There are many great movies out that spark conversation and highlight the accomplishments of people of color. Mm. Yeah. So there are many things you can do. What I will say not to do, don't rush to action in anger mm. or righteous indignation because it can actually do more harm than good. Right. God gave me the verse, Proverbs 15, 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. God has never responded to our brokenness with force or anger. Mm. Never. Mm. In, in Isaiah 61, 6, he says, he has called me to bind up the brokenhearted. Not confront the brokenhearted, not shout at the brokenhearted, mm. not judge the brokenhearted, but bind up the brokenhearted, those who are wounded right now. We don't want to create more tension and anger in the world, which eventually people of color are going to be responsible for and have to clean up. We want to do this with thought. We want to do this with love. People of color cannot walk away from that once it's put out there. If you do want to make a difference externally, get involved in the work that people of color are already doing. Mm. Let them lead it and follow and ask them, what can I do to be helpful right now? Mm. I want to take a minute to just talk to all my friends and family of color that are watching, all 20 of you out there right now. Stop it. <laughs> Brian just went, <gasps> I'm just kidding. We have come a long way. Walnut Hill, my sister and I talk about 20 years ago, we were the only raisins in this bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> but we've come a long way. And I just want to let you know of the 18 people in this room right now making this happen, half of us are of color. Mm. And that says something. But let me speak to you for a moment. Jesus was angry. It's okay to be angry. Yeah. Jesus was hurt. Jesus wept and he knows how you feel. Mm. We know that you're hurting right now. Put on your oxygen mask first. Take care of yourself, take care of your family. Yeah. There is time to get this work done. Yeah. Pray, meditate, invite the Holy Spirit to show you what your next steps are in this and be led by that, by that word of God, by that wisdom of God, by that voice of God. And I, I was convicted this week myself by Colossians 3.12, where Paul says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's mm. the patience that God convicted me of, to be patient. Mm. This is not a marathon, it's a sprint. This has been a 400-year journey it's to get us. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You're absolutely right. I just, want, I just thought that was important to clarify. I accept that correction from you, my white brother. <laughs> this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yes. And we have to heal. And I've been praying that God would allow me to operate in the grace of God yeah. as Jesus has shown me that grace so willingly. Everyone, we're going to make mistakes in this. We're going to say the wrong thing, as I just did. You know, we have to own those mistakes and move through it, and that's part of the, the process of growth. So we have to expect that going into it. Mm. But as my wise friend Samara told me recently, you show me effort, and I'll show you grace. Amen. We're called to grace. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we hope that this has been helpful for us, um, convicting. Uh, challenging, of course, but um, we want to be a, a, a body that we say we are family. We truly want to be family together. 
And we want to show this world what it looks like to love. And we want to show Jesus. And uh, we want to pray. And so uh, we're going to end today's message and then move into a song that was actually written by our worship community here years ago about uh, being one in the Spirit. But uh, we want to pray first. And, and one thing I want to draw your attention to is actually this Friday night, we're going to host a prayer event at the Bethel campus from 5 to 8 o'clock. You can come in, in that zone at any point, 5 to 8 o'clock. And we're going to do a, a prayer walk. And you'll have a host that will walk you around the, the prayer circle here. There'll be six different stations where we pray against injustice, but we also pray for unity. So I just want to encourage you to come out for that. If that'd be something you, you, you'd um, just uh, be, that would be a good thing for you. Come out, bring your friends. It's a community event. Anybody can come and, and pray. But we also wanted to say a prayer today, and, and Crystal's actually written a beautiful prayer. You know, about 50 of the Psalms are called lament Psalms. And these are just petitioning to God for his help in our hurts, in our sorrow. And so Crystal's written this beautiful prayer. She's going to pray it for us, but we're also going to post it because I want to challenge you to pray this for the next seven days. Each morning, let's pray this as church together. Crystal, would you lead us? Can we stand together? Let's stand together, yeah. Oh, Lord, our God, dear, sweet, and beautiful Jesus, consoling and comforting Holy Spirit, hear the cry of our hearts, we have disregarded the beauty of your creation as we chose self over others. How dare we choose disunity over the greatness of the love with which you have loved us. Forgive us for loving our own comfort more than you, more than our brother, more than our sister. Teach us, Lord Jesus, the love of the cross, of bearing the weight of pain for others in our own bodies. Teach us how to mourn, not just from pain we have experienced, but from the pain we see on our brothers and sisters' faces. Transform us, Lord, and give us new hearts that we might reveal the magnitude of your love for all people. Mm. Open our eyes that we may see who you created each man, each woman, each child to be. We are all part of the masterpiece you have created and have orchestrated since the dawn of time. Lord Jesus, bind us together with a unity based on your love that can never be extinguished a unity that can never be destroyed. Make the light of your love shine through us into the darkness of fear, hatred, bigotry, and violence. As your image bearers, we shout hallelujah, for you are the victorious one. Amen. You hear the echoes of our hearts and will answer. Let the words of your mouth and the praise of your name be on our lips forever. Amen. Amen.
presence is such a gift, isn't it? As we are praying and worshiping and singing, I could just feel the Lord's presence. And I, I saw a picture. I, I saw the Lord coming upon our homes. And I could see the Lord just reaching down and just ministering in the exact places that each one of us need. And for the dear sister who wrote that letter that we read today, I saw the Lord reaching into your home. He's moving in your family's life in a powerful way. He's so proud of you. He loves you. Just want to encourage you to receive that today. You know, church, this has been an important day for us. And I want to thank Nero and Crystal and Tim. Thank you for preaching with Brian. Thank you for sharing your hearts with us. Thank you for speaking God's truth. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for encouraging us. And thank you for sharing those practical things that we can do. You know, so often the church is accused of just talking and praying and not doing anything. And that's not gonna be us. You, know, you heard Brian say, we're gonna pray this Friday. So church, we wanna invite you to come out to the Bethel campus. We're gonna seek the Lord together. We're gonna listen. And then we're gonna do whatever he tells us to do. You know, in just a moment, I'm going to close with a benediction. I'm going to do that by asking you to stand and pray. But before I do that, I just want to share just two quick announcements. One on Tuesday night, we have the privilege of having our former senior pastor, Clive Calver, with us on our conversations program. Join us online for that. And then this next weekend, Brian, Craig, and I are going to be preaching together for our annual meeting weekend. We'll be preaching during the services if you're one of our members, you received a mailing, an email, telling you how you can participate in our annual meeting. It's going to be taking place between services and at select times. Call us in the office this week if you have any questions. But now, church, I want to invite you to stand wherever you are. And as you do, I want you to recognize that you're standing with upwards of 3,000 people in Connecticut, New York, and New England, and the United States across the world. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for your presence. Your presence is what makes a difference. Lord, we're just very knowledgeable that what we spoke about today is right in the center of your heart. And Lord, we acknowledge that we need your help. We need your help, Lord. Lord, we don't want this just to be a moment where we pause and we move on. Lord, we want this to be the moment in the history of the United States that's written upon where you went deep and you dealt with these issues. And so, Lord, we pray now for the repentance that's needed, for the reconciliation that's needed, for the forgiveness that's needed, for the healing that's needed. Lord, for the change that is needed, we pray for change. 
And Lord, as you prayed in John 17, we want to be first. We pray that you would make us one. We declare that today, Lord, we step in and we want to be one. Make us one. That the world will see. They'll see us as an example. They'll see us as a bright light. For your glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you this week.